Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Tonight, we're going to talk about another one of Daniel's mysteries, and particularly the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, there's a lot of information to get through in a short period of time, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. We begin our study of the book of Daniel by looking at the eighth chapter. You'll remember that in chapter seven, we saw a little more power that would arise that was both a religious kingdom and a political kingdom. And it would come from the ruins of the Roman Empire. Now we learned that this power would attempt to substitute tradition for God's word, human law for God's law, and human teachings for teachings that are divine. And at the end of chapter 7, the news of this trouble, of, of, this, um, of this power, troubled Daniel. But Daniel gained confidence by looking away from what was going on around him, and by focusing his attention on the God of heaven who could help him. And that lets me know that when I'm going through my trials and my times of difficulty, I can look away from the difficulty, and I can focus on the God of heaven who by faith can help me. Do you have this confidence tonight? Amen. Daniel chapter 7 ends with one pulse of harmony beating throughout the universe. It ends with the entire universe, again, serving and obeying God. Now, we read about this in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 27. I'll give you a minute to turn there. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 27. Daniel chapter 7. Verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. When God created Adam and Eve, they were fashioned to obey God. They were created to serve Him and to please Him. But somehow, once they were put into this garden home, Lucifer came along and deceived Adam and Eve. And so because of their sin, ours is a world in brokenness. Ours is a world in rebellion. Adam and Eve, through their sin, forfeited their garden home. But Jesus Christ came along to prove that Men and women could still obey God in spite of the temptations of Satan. Because in a world of sin and rebellion, Christ was loyal. In a world of brokenness, Christ was obedient. It was into the world that Jesus came and he revealed to men that it is still possible to keep God's commandments. In a world of disobedience, Christ proved to be obedient. And in Daniel chapter 7, the Bible tells us that one day the universe will again choose to serve and obey God. Now we're in Daniel chapter 8 where the conflict intensifies. Here the prophet, the prophet focuses on events occurring at the end of time. Open your Bibles please to Daniel chapter 8. And we're going to begin by looking at verses 3 to 5. Daniel chapter 8, verses 3 to 5. The Bible says, Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there, standing beside the river, was a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but the higher one, sorry, but there was one higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no animal could withstand him. Nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did but he did according to his will, and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. We see here that animals are again used to represent nations in the Bible. But these animals aren't fierce and warlike like the ones we saw in chapter 7. Instead, God uses the symbolism of a ram, and a male goat. The ram puts his head down, the male goat puts his head down, and they run, and they collide. And the ram is crushed by the male goat. Now, before we can continue studying this prophecy, 
I want you to notice something. Here, the Bible uses the symbolism of rams and male goats. And these are the two animals that were used in the sanctuary system. So in order for us to understand this prophecy, that means that we need to understand something about the sanctuary system because God wants to tell us something in the symbolism of the ram and the male goat. Even before we start to fully understand this prophecy, God is telling us that he's pointing us to the sanctuary and he's giving us signposts on our journey because he wants us to know where we're headed. So under the sanctuary system, if a person sinned, they would bring a lamb without spot and without blemish. Why without spot and without blemish? Because that lamb would represent Jesus Christ, who never sinned. And he was without spot and without blemish in character. So Jesus, the perfect Christ, who takes our place in sin, is represented in the spotless lamb. See, we are too sinful to enter into God's presence without a sacrifice. So we slay the sacrifice because it's our sins that led Jesus to the cross. We come guilty and condemned, but as we slay the sacrifice, we can leave the sanctuary sane. The burden of guilt can roll right off your shoulder. In your mind, I want you to picture Christ. Picture his arms outstretched for you. Picture the blood spurting from his hands. Picture the blood rolling down his face. He is the lamb who died for you. It's his blood that was shed for you. Amen. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the burden of guilt can roll right off your shoulder right now, regardless of your past mistakes. We need a lamb who dies, but we also need a priest who lives. Jesus is not only the sacrificial lamb, but he's also representing you before the Father's throne as our high priest in heaven. Your heartaches are on his heart. Your burdens are on his mind. And your sorrows fill his life. He's moved by our grief and by our disappointments. He represents us in heaven's sanctuary. The Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession for us. And as a result, we can come boldly to the throne of grace where we can obtain help in times of need. Do you have a time of need right now? Is there some problem going on in your life? I want to encourage you. Come to Jesus, because he's your priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, once a year, a special service took place called the cleansing of the sanctuary, or the Day of Atonement. Some of you, if you have Jewish roots, you might know it as Yom Kippur. I know many of the kids had it off for, uh, for a holiday in, uh, in September. The ram and the male goat were special sacrifices that were used on this particular day. So in Daniel chapter 8, God uses these two symbols, the ram and the male goat, to represent the two nations that he had previously symbolized with fierce beasts. He does this because he wants us to immediately see, actually before I go there, I want to just kind of backtrack and talk about the previous nights. You see, prophecy does something called repeat and expand. First God tells us something, and then he repeats it again with greater detail. So in Daniel chapter 2, we saw an outline of world history from Nebuchadnezzar's time all the way down to the end of time. Then in Daniel chapter 7, we saw an outline of world history from Nebuchadnezzar's time all the way down to the end of time. But this time, it added more detail about that little horn power as we got closer to the end of time. Now, we're in Daniel chapter 8, and God is using the symbolism of the ram and the male goat because he wants us to immediately see that when he uses this symbol of the ram and the male goat, he's coming right down to the end of time. He's coming right down to the final judgment. He's coming right to the cleansing of the sanctuary. And he's giving us little signposts. He's positioning us because he wants us to see where we're headed. So now that we understand the connection between the sanctuary service and the uh, eighth chapter of the book of Daniel, let's look a little bit more closely at what the ram and the male goat represent. So we're going to go to Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 to 21. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 to 21. Will you have it say amen? Amen. amen. 
All right. The ram which you saw, having two horns, they are the kings of Midia and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So the ram represents Midia Persia. The male goat represents Greece. The large horn is the first king, who is who? Alexander the Great. You know what I like about Bible prophecy? The Bible doesn't leave it open for us to try to figure things out or come up with our own conclusions and come up with all kinds of theories to try to figure out what it really means. The best way to interpret the Bible is to let the Bible interpret itself. Amen. So according to scripture, this goat represents the, uh, the, the kingdom of Greece and the first horn, the little big horn, sorry, the big horn that comes out of his, uh, between his eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great. The use of sanctuary animals shows us that God is going to be talking to us not just about a political challenge, but about a religious challenge. So in Daniel chapter 2, we saw Satan's attack on God's authority. In Daniel chapter 7, we saw Satan's attack on God's kingdom. But now we're in Daniel chapter 8, where we're about to witness Satan's attack on God's truth. So, why do you think that the ram has two horns? Well, what nations overthrew Babylon? Yeah. Media and Persia. The Bible is very specific about this. Now, let's look again at verse 3. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. So we see two horns, right? And the higher one comes up last. The first horn represents Midia, and the other represents Persia, because the Persians were stronger than the Medes, and they came up last, just as the Bible described. Now let's look at a little bit more detail in verse 4. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and south. Guess what? Midia Persia pushed westward, northward, and south. Now we come to the goat in verse 5. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And this is exactly right. The Grecian Empire, when this notable horn, Alexander the Great, came from the west when it came against Middle Persia. Verse 6. Then he came to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And this is exactly what happened when Greece overthrew Media Persia. But notice what happens in verse 8. Therefore the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in the place of it, four notable ones came up for the four winds of heaven. Hmm. So at the peak of his power, Alexander the Great dies. And history reports that in his place, four generals took his place. Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. So this is very similar to what we saw in Daniel chapter 7, because you had that leopard that represented Greece, but it had four heads representing these same exact four generals. Let's continue by reading verse 9. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. The little horn of Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8 are different symbols, but they both represent the same power both a religious and a political power. So now we understand that this little horn comes from out of the four winds of the heavens, or one of the four directional points on the globe, particularly the west. Pagan Rome basically is coming from the west, beginning its growth all throughout Europe, to the south, then to the east, and then to the glorious Holy Land. And there's a lot of evidence to support this interpretation. Now here's some information that you can't get everywhere. I want to share something with you. We're going to look a little bit more closely at verses 8 and 9. Because, remember that scripture where it said, let's just read it first. Therefore, the he goat grew very great. And when it was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great 
toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. I got a good question for you. When the scripture here says, out of one of them, what is the them we're referring to? Think so? Any other suggestions? What do you guys think? What's the them referring to? Well, if you look at the original language of this phrase, out of one of them, the original Hebrew states, from the one, from them. So in that particular um, phrase, it's actually two prepositions, not one in the original Hebrew. Now, here's the thing. The only possible antecedents for them in this text are either the four notable ones or the four winds of heaven. Which is it? Well, let's take a look. If we look at the phrase out of one of them, and we look at the original Hebrew and its syntax, we find the gender sequence. Feminine, masculine. So from the one is feminine, whereas them is masculine and plural. So in order for this, in order to find the proper antecedent, we have to know the proper gender order. Feminine, masculine. Well, if you look at four notable ones, the problem with it is that the gender order, or the, the gender order or gender sequence is feminine and neutered. So four notable ones or four appearances cannot possibly be the antecedent of this pronoun then. But if we look at four winds of heaven, or in the original Hebrew, four winds of the heavens, we see that it's feminine, plural masculine. So the proper antecedent of out of one of them is four winds of heaven. There's more uh, evidence than just that. Now, remember I told you that the original Hebrew, the phrase was, from the one, from them. That means that the one originates from them. So where does the little horn come from? The little horn comes from the one that comes from them. Did you catch that? Yeah. Okay. So, if we replace the pronouns with four appearances, this doesn't work. Because essentially what you would be saying is, from the four, from the appearances, came the little horn. Does that make any sense? No. Right? But, when you replace it with four winds of the heavens, the phrase begins to make a whole lot more sense. So, from the one, or the winds, from them, the heavens. Because winds can originate from heavens. So in other words, the phrase would be, from the winds, sorry, from one of the winds that are from the heavens. Does that, does that phrase make sense? So based on the original language and the syntax, we can tell that the little horn comes from the four winds of the heavens, not from the four horns. So if you didn't understand everything I just said, that's okay. Let me just sum it up for you. The little horn originates from the four winds of the heavens, not from one of the four horns. The little horn comes from one of the four directional points on the globe, particularly the west, not from the Grecian Empire. The little horn cannot be Antiochus IV. There are many websites out there and many different resources that uh, assume it's Antiochus. However, they are wrong. Many internet sources don't even have an accurate criticism of this particular position and misrepresent what the church teaches about this evidence. So a great resource that you can use if you want more information on this subject would be Selected Studies of Prophetic Interpretations, the Revised Edition, by William H. Shea. So let's do a little bit more studying about this little horn power. In verse 10, something fascinating happens. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. So we see here that there's this vertical growth. The attack is no longer on a level playing field. It's, it's now attacking vertical. So it's not just a political power, but also a religious power. Reaching right up into heaven, casting down some of the hosts of heaven and the stars to the ground. Now, when I first read this prophecy, I had, I had to figure this out. Because, I mean, how on earth do you attack the host of heaven? I mean, did any of you wonder that? I mean, how do you attack the host of heaven and trample the truth to the ground? How is that possible? 
Let's take a look at verse 11. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Pretty serious. Now, I want to point your attention to a few things in this verse. Number one, you see that word sacrifices there? If you look at the King James Version of the Bible, you'll notice that the word sacrifices is in italics. This is because the word sacrifices is not in the original language. The King James translators, as they were translating the Bible into English, put the word there because it made sense to them based on the context as they were translating it into English. But the way that this text actually should read is like this. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So if the word sacrifices there doesn't belong, what does the Bible mean when it says the daily, or this tamid in the original Hebrew? It could also be translated the continual. What is it talking about? What does the Bible mean by the daily, this temi, or this continual? Well, simply put, we'll get into more detail about it later, but simply put, it's the daily, continual ministration of Jesus Christ in the holy place of the sanctuary. The offerings, the sacrifices, the lampstand, the altar of incense, the table of shoe bread, everything done on a daily basis for the intercession of God's people. Now, what about this prince of the host? Who's that? Who would be the prince of the host? Jesus Christ. That's right. So, do you remember what we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? We read about that just before the end of time, there would be a departure or a falling away from the truth. Let's go back to that text. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. The Bible says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, do you know what the word perdition means? It means that he's a traitor. It means that he has betrayed the truth. It means that he's substituting <laughs> his own words for God's words. So according to Daniel chapter 7, a religious power and a political power would arise with a leader that would claim the privileges and the prerogatives of God. One of those, in Daniel chapter 7, would even try to change God's law. So Daniel chapter 7 describes this apostasy or drift away from the very word of God and Daniel chapter 8 continues on that same theme. Now let's go back to Daniel chapter 8 and we're going to look at verse 12. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily and he cast truth down to the ground he did all this and prospered. Notice I left out the word sacrifices because it's not in the original language. So a religious power and a political power would grow. He would cast down the real truth about Jesus and the daily administration of intercession in the sanctuary system. All kinds of relics would be introduced rather than Jesus. All kinds of earthly penances would be introduced rather than Jesus. Rather than Jesus, the slain Lamb of God, and rather than God's grace, rather than the truth about the sanctuary, the blood of Christ and of the Lamb would be cast down. The truth about Jesus as our only mediator between God and man would be cast down. The truth about our great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, interceding on our behalf, the only priest who could, who could forgive sins, would be cast down. The truth about God's law, leading men and women back to obedience, would be cast down, and cast down for the traditions of men. But there is good news. The Bible says that truth that has been cast down will one day be completely restored. 
the traditions of men that have spread darkness across this world will be illuminated by the light of God's truth. In the pages of Bible prophecy and in the pages of our lives, light always dispels the darkness. So, verse 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled <laughs> underfoot? This verse pictures two angelic beings, and one says to the other, How long will the truth about Jesus be cast down? How long? That's the question. And verse 14 answers it. And he said unto me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. So at the end of this 2,300 day period, or this 2,300 years, the errors will be cleansed. The real truth about Jesus and the sanctuary will be finally revealed. Then God's truth about Jesus as the dying lamb and the priest who lives will go to the ends of the world. The light of Jesus' forgiveness, the light of his mercy, the light of his forgiveness and his obedience to his law, the, all this light will be coming to mankind. And this means that in the final judgment of Earth's history, light is coming to mankind. But what about these 2,300 days? The text says for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now notice three things here. First of all, there's a time period, right? There's 2,300 days. There's an, uh, a place, a sanctuary. And then there's this event, the cleansing of the sanctuary. What's this all mean? Well, if you take 2,300 literal days from Daniel's time, how many years would that be? Roughly about a little over six years. But according to what the angel tells Daniel in verse 17, this can't be. So verse 17 says this. So he came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid, and I fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, the vision refers to the time of the end. So the vision of the cleansing of the sanctuary doesn't apply to that time where Daniel lived. It applies to the time of the end. Notice again verse 19. And he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. So this 2300 day period runs out right when the time of the end begins. God's truth is restored so therefore, these 2,300 days must not be literal days. But what do they mean? It must mean something else. But what? Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 says this. I have laid on you each day for a year. year. So according to Bible prophecy, a prophetic day is equal to <laughs> one literal year. So the 2,300 days are not days, but actually 2,300 days years. We will look more closely at the beginning date of the judgment, or when the 2300 days begins in another lesson. But note this point. One angel saying to the other, when will the truth about Jesus as the Lamb who dies, about his mercy and his forgiveness, about uh, this priest who lives to make intercession for us in heaven, about this call to obedience and the light of the sanctuary, when will that occur? And the other angel replies, at the end of the 2300 days or years. So at the end of time, there's this final great restoration of truth. But still, this is not only a time period mentioned here, but also an event. The 2300 years from Daniel's time takes us down to the end of time. But there's also this event, and that event is the cleansing of the sanctuary. So the Bible talks about two sanctuaries. First, there was the sanctuary which men built, Moses' sanctuary, right? And then it talks about the, the sanctuary that was established by God, the one that the Lord pitched and not man. 
So now the question is, what does this expression mean in Daniel 8.14, cleansing of the sanctuary? Well, every day, lambs were slain in the court. Every day, sinners came to the court to slay these animals. Every day, the blood of the animal was brought into the holy place, the first compartment of the sanctuary, and only once a year would the high priest enter into the most holy place of the sanctuary. And he did that on the last day of the Jewish year, a day called Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, the day of the cleansing of the sanctuary. So I have some things here to make it clear. This is the Old, pro the Old Testament process explained in a nutshell. <laughs> Step number one, the sinner brings an animal and confesses his sin. Step number two, the priest slays the animal which dies for the sins of the sinner. Step number three, then the priest takes the animal blood, step number four, and he brings it into the sanctuary and puts it on the altar. That's the Old Testament system in a nutshell. What does it mean? Well, sin was transferred from the sinner to the animal, which dies on the sinner's behalf. Then it was transferred to the priest when he dips his hand in the blood, and he bears it before a holy God. And then ultimately, he transfers it to the sanctuary where it, where it accumulates over time. Mm -hmm. So through this process, sin is removed from the sinner and ultimately transferred to the sanctuary where it accumulates, contaminates, and pollutes the sanctuary. And then it needs to be cleaned out after a period of time. What does this look like in the New Testament? Same process. The sinner confesses his sins through Jesus. Step two. Jesus gave up his life on behalf of, uh, of us, and then he covers our sins. Step three, he functions as our priest, bearing our sins before God, who is holy, in the heavenly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Step four, Jesus has the entire record of sin that has been accumulated in the heavenly sanctuary. And this record contaminates and pollutes the heavenly sanctuary. And after time, it has to be removed and blotted out. So, New Testament process explained. The sinner comes to Jesus. Sin is transferred from the sinner to Jesus, who already died on the sinner's behalf. Jesus, resurrected, functions as our high priest in heaven, bearing our sins before God and in the heavenly sanctuary. And the record of all the sins from everyone in the world, from Adam's time all the way down to now, is present and has accumulated in the heavenly sanctuary. And this record contaminates and pollutes the heavenly sanctuary. Now think about this. Here's some food for thought. Now remember that in ancient Israel, when they did these services in the earthly tabernacle, uh, the sinner would come and offer his sacrifice, and then the sin would be transferred to the sanctuary. And then once a year, it was cleaned out. Now imagine when you have a whole nation of people doing this over the course of a year, how much sin would accumulate in the sanctuary in one year? A lot, right? Now I want you to fast forward to the New Testament. Imagine that the process of the Day of Atonement doesn't take place once a year. It takes place once in a lifetime. So imagine the accumulation of the record of sin from Adam's time all the way down to the end of time. How much sin would the priest have to bear in the heavenly sanctuary? That's what Jesus is doing for you right now. So, let's look at the Old Testament process and the New Testament process side by side. Sin is transferred from the sinner to the sacrifice that died on the sinner's behalf. Sin is then born by the priest before God who is holy, and it ultimately accumulates in the sanctuary, and at some point it has to be removed. So what does this mean for us today? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when you confess that you're a sinner, Jesus removes the sin from you and he takes it onto himself. He paid the penalty for your sin. And he stands before God bearing the record of your shame and your guilt, of your past mistakes, so that you no longer have to. Mm -hmm. 
And this, in essence, is how God does for you what you can't do for yourself. This is the gospel. Amen. Now, follow me closely here. Every aspect of the sanctuary system, every aspect of the Jewish economy, represents something about Jesus Christ and his mission to save us. For example, the dying lamb in the court represents Christ's death outside of the tabernacle of heaven, in the courtyard of this world. So, in the Bible, once a year, the high priest entered into the very presence of God before the Shekinah glory. There, before the presence of God, at the end of the Jewish New Year, all of Israel gathered around for one final examination of the heart, for one final cleansing of the soul, for the final commitment of loyalty and obedience to God. After Christ died, he ascended into heaven, into heaven's sanctuary as our priest. Jesus is the lamb who dies, but he's also the priest who lives. The Bible says that father and son enter into a special work called the cleansing of the sanctuary or the judgment at the end of time. So the term cleansing of the sanctuary is synonymous with the term judgment. They mean the same thing. Now what happened in the earthly sanctuary during this time of cleansing of the sanctuary? What happened during the Day of Atonement? Open your Bibles please to Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 30. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 30. If you have it, say amen. For on that day, the priest shall make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Now, what does this word atonement mean? Well, if you break it into three parts, you get at, one, meant. So atonement simply means to be at one with God. Now let's quickly review. Every day, sinners came and offered the lamb of sacrifice, symbolizing that their sins were forgiven. Every day, the priests, on behalf of the people, entered into the sanctuary and applied the blood so that the sin would be forgiven. Every day, as people came to the sanctuary feeling discouraged and depressed from their guilt, they could leave the sanctuary feeling happy, feeling free, feeling forgiven, and feeling peaceful. Then, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, during the annual cleansing of the sanctuary, the high priest entered into the sanctuary. And as he came before the most holy place, before the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence was, all of Israel gathered around for, uh, to recommit their lives to God. They knelt and they prayed, Oh God, we love you. We want to be done with our sins. We want to be totally obedient to you. We want our hearts to be clean. We want to be at one with God. Whatever path you lead us on, in loving obedience, we want to follow. Is that your desire tonight? Amen. Today, there is no earthly sanctuary. So the Bible says that at the end of time, sometime after these 2,300 years have run out, the earthly sanctuary, I'm sorry, the heavenly sanctuary would be cleansed. So, before this judgment begins, right at the end of time, God would make one final appeal. An appeal to men and women to find his mercy. An appeal to men and women to find his grace. An appeal to men and women to open their hearts to him. That's God's appeal to you and I today. Christ would be exalted before the whole world as our Savior. As the Savior of the world again. You might just go out. My voice is loud enough, but I'll just take the, uh, the microphone. All right. So Christ will be exalted as the Savior of the world again. He will be exalted above all ideologies above all traditions, above all religions. Christ would be exalted, as, again, as our dying land, in the light of this final cleansing of the sanctuary. Christ would be exalted as our high priest, the one who knows us, the one who understands us, the one who knows our, our heartaches and our burdens. 
So, like the priest who represented the people, Christ will be exalted as our high priest. He's the one who knows us, the one who understands us, who knows our discouragements, our disappointments, our longings, our loneliness, and our depression. That Christ is pictured before the throne of heaven, before the Father, interceding on behalf of you and I. And so your name is on his heart. Your name is on his mind. Your name is before God's throne in heaven in your high priest, Jesus Christ. As the sanctuary is cleansed, all the pollution established by man-made religion is removed and wiped out. All the errors that are taught by human beings are exposed to what they really are. All the falsehoods taught by man-made religious teachers are cast out into the light of day. And from heaven's sanctuary, in this final moment of time, God's last call for obedience goes forward. The call of the sanctuary is the call of Daniel. And it's also the call of Jesus Christ as our high priest. A call to love him and to obey him, to serve him, and to give our lives to him. It's the call of Jesus as our Savior, pleading with our hearts right now, no matter how far you may have drifted from him, no matter how far or how much you may have disappointed him, no matter how much your heart may have wandered from him, the call of Daniel chapter 8 is the call to come back to Jesus. Not to gather at some earthly sanctuary, but to gather wherever we are and to kneel before heaven's throne, before our great high priest in the great sanctuary of heaven. Because Jesus, as our great high priest, is appealing for us or for the whole universe. Now, there's one thing I didn't share with you when I was going through the whole sanctuary system that I'm going to share with you now. Now, if any of you have ever done any studying of the Old Testament and how the uh, cleansing of the sanctuary worked, you would know that the high priest had to wear what? Yes, a robe, but there's something else. Bells. And the bells were to make sure that he was still alive. Because if he had one little spot of sin on him, if he sinned in thought, deed, or action, he would instantly drop dead before God's presence. Because God is holy, and sin cannot stand in God's presence and live. So, the high priest had to wear bells so that they knew as long as he was walking around, they would hear the bells. And that if he, you know, if you stopped hearing the bells, then you knew that he had dropped dead and they would have something to drag him out. So that, so that uh, they knew that they couldn't continue with the service. So, how many of you people, based on that, would want the high priest job? <laughs> I sure do. So now when you factor in that Jesus is in the temple of heaven, bearing the entire record of sin of all humanity before a holy God, that says a lot about his love for us. So this is a call to accept him as our Savior and to open our hearts to him. To accept his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness. This call is to accept him and his power to change our lives. And our lives do need changing. Because as we look at the things that are going on in the world today, a lot of lives need changing. And he wants us, he wants to enable us to live in harmony with his law. So Daniel chapter 8 calls us to be done with man-made religions and man-made traditions and to give our lives completely to Jesus Christ. Have you ever won the lottery? Well, a guy named Steve did. He won $107,000 a year for the rest of his life. Now you'd think that this would have made him happy, but Steve's wife of 17 years, Kim, was planning on leaving him for another guy. And so, the only problem was that she not only wanted to leave him, but to take his money with her. So, she was on the phone one day with her lover, planning to hire a hitman to kill Steve, but her son happened to overhear the conversation. And he reported the news to his father. His father was very upset, called the police, and the police caught her in the very act of handing the hitman the money. So she was arrested and sentenced to prison. But then something unexpected happened. You see, Steve began to think, 
Am I really about to throw away my marriage of 17 years? Steve thought that there might be something worth holding it together. He wasn't ready to give up hope. He began visiting his wife in the jail. And over a three-month period of time, a new love developed in his heart for her. And when she saw his loyalty and his faithfulness, she broke down and she, she cried. She, she wept right there in the cell. And he bailed her out of prison, dropped all the charges, and their marriage is happy even today. Love breaks down our hard hearts. There's not one thing that that woman wouldn't do for Steve today because of his love for her. And when I look at the sanctuary, I see love. I see love in a dying land, the Christ who died for me. I see love in a priest who intercedes on my behalf before the Father in the sanctuary of heaven. I also see love in a priest who calls to me, who appeals to me to obey him and to follow him. You know, Satan hates these truths. Satan wants me to think that I have to perform all kinds of works in order to be saved. But God says, come and accept your land. Confess your sins. And be covered by the blood of Christ. By grace, you are saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of ourselves. Not by works. So Satan wants to establish all kinds of people between us and God. All kinds of earthly systems and earthly priests. He's done it in paganism. He's done it with earthly priests. He's done it even in some forms of Christianity. But there's one mediator between God and man. And that mediator is Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Satan wants us to turn our backs on God's law and develop a self-appointed system of worship. Our own self-appointed religion. But just as that woman whose heart was broken down by the love of her husband desires nothing more today than to please him, when our hearts have been broken down by the love of Christ, we too would desire nothing more than to please our God. Amen. And so the final days of Earth's history, God appeals to us to love him and to obey him. Now, this might be some of the first times that you guys are hearing these truths. And right now, maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. And you understand that Jesus is having his hands with, with his blood pleading on your behalf before the Father's throne. And he wants to wipe out the record of your past mistakes. And so right now, my question to you is, do you want the record of your sins blotted out? Do you want all of your past mistakes forgiven and cleansed? Do you want to take part in the cleansing of the sanctuary and have your life covered by the blood of Jesus? If that's your desire, I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we have heard your word, Lord, and the message of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I pray, Lord, for every individual here. I pray, Lord, for all of these church members and those who may be hearing this for the first time, those who may never have entered the church before in their lives. But Lord, they have heard your word today and they understand, Lord, that you are interceding on behalf of your people in the sanctuary of heaven before your Father. And so, Father, I ask that every heart here be touched by this word and that your blood would cover every person in this church under the sound of my voice. And I pray, Lord, for every individual that they would give their lives and their hearts to you. Forgive them, Father, of their sins. Forgive us all, Lord, of our unrighteousness. And cleanse us, Lord, and help us to walk with you. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.